Good evening and welcome to League of Women Voters Presents. On behalf of the Boone County and Columbia League of Women Voters, I'm Jim Robertson. The trends are unmistakable and stubborn as public support declines, tuition increases, and student loan debt uh, follows. Uh, in this country at this time, we have approaching a trillion dollars in student loan debt, far exceeding credit card debt overall. Uh, of graduating seniors and four-year four institutions, $25,000 is the amount of debt that the average student takes with them. And of those who are paying back student loans, one in six are in default. With me tonight are three distinguished <coughs> leaders in higher education in Columbia and, and in Missouri. On my far right is Jim Spain, you are Vice Provost for Academic Affairs at the University of Missouri. Right, for undergraduate programs, that's uh, right. Undergraduate, right. and I'm sorry. Nope. Terry Smith at Columbia College is the Dean of Academic Affairs. Right. And Evelyn Jorgensen is the uh, President of that's Moberly correct. Area Community College. Yes. Thank you for joining us, welcome. I'm curious, and I, I'm, I'm gonna ask you, starting with Jim, uh, to talk about um, tuition and the effect on student debt of tuition right. and what you are doing at MU to uh, help students navigate that and come out uh, in a sustainable kind of career. Right, um, and student debt is a significant challenge facing um, higher education um, and, and by and large driven or influenced heavily by the factors that you just described. Um, and if I'll, I'll draw some from some statistics, Jim. In 1990, across the country, our, our country invested $8.60 per $1,000 of personal income to support higher education. 20 years later, we're, we're investing $5.69 per $1,000 of personal income. And without uh, an advance in tuition, which has been required, um, we we wouldn't be able to afford to support higher education at the levels that, that we need to achieve. And so with higher tuition has come higher financial responsibility among students. And unfortunately, um, some families have failed to adequately prepare. It's almost like saving for a wedding. Um, they, they've inadequately prepared to help underwrite the cost of their, their child's education and like we do with other things in our society today, we lean on, on borrowing abilities. Um, and so at, at MU, what we've tried to do is, is certainly maintain tuition as low as possible to, to reduce the financial um, strain on families. At the same time, trying to help students blend and package as many different financial aid forms to avoid as much loan student loan debt as, as we can. And as students um, accumulate loan debts, and our financial aid advisors actually become very involved in trying to work with the students to help them understand the, the liability they're assuming to try and, and underwrite financially their, their education at Mizzou. Mm -hmm. Dr. Terry Smith, you're at a private institution. It's a little bit different uh, than, than my other two guests here. Um, Still, I'm sure that endowment income and whatnot is, is down these days with interest rates. Uh, you have pressure on tuition also. Uh, what's, what's happening at Columbia College? Uh, a couple of things about the college that are, uh, I think, really uh, bragging points, really. One of them is that we have the uh, second or third lowest tuition of any private liberal arts college in the state. Uh, we're in the bottom 20% nationally, so we start off being relatively affordable. And the, U, the new U.S. News and World Report uh, rankings came out and uh, we were, as, as we have been um, many times in the past, ranked among the lowest in the Midwest of uh, master's degree granting institutions in terms of student debt. So uh, that's all good. However, there, there's still debt problems. And you were uh, quoting some statistics and, and uh, they're really uh, fascinating. And, but I think that there are some myths about student aid and student loan debt and stuff. And, and I've got a, a couple of statistics to, uh, to, to talk about just to follow on what Jim was saying. One of the reasons that 
loans have gone up is because of the, especially the, uh, the public institutions, the, the state support. Uh, the level of state support in 1965 was 50% of all of the revenue for uh, public institutions. It's down to uh, 30% now, and there are some states like Colorado where it's 2%. Correct. I mean, it's yeah. ridiculous, mm -hmm. right? And uh, they're, they're not state supported, they're state tolerated, you know. <laughs> and then uh, um, the, the, there's a lot of talk, especially in the media, about this being the next bubble, uh, student loans. Well, comparing it to housing, and, and your, your uh, figure is pretty close, there's a total of $867 billion in student, uh, student debt right now. The housing, the, the amount of uh, mortgage debt in the country is 22 trillion. Yeah. And so, um, the, if the when the burst, house, the housing market burst, houses, uh, housing lost eight trillion dollars in value. So, if all of the loans um, were defaulted, student loans were defaulted at the same time, which isn't going to happen, it still wouldn't be nearly as big as the housing bubble. So, let's be careful how we use the term bubble. Sure. The other thing is that students borrow way too much. And I think there are some students who, students who, sure. do, who do borrow way too much. But uh, overall, and a lot of times they'll go and get these uh, sobbing students with the $200,000 in debt. That's five, uh, less, uh, that's, uh, five tenths of 1% students borrow that much. 43% uh, of all students who borrow in the United States borrow between uh, one and $10,000. 30% between 10 and $25,000. Of course, these are, this isn't news because these students have borrowed small amounts of money and they pay it back uh, as they're supposed to. A third of all students who go to college in the United States have no debt whatsoever. And the average is just a little sl slightly lower than the number you, you quoted, it's $20,000. Uh, $20, these are college board figures that I got just today, actually. Mm -hmm. and, but one, um, one half of all the defaults, you, once, once one out of six is in default, one half are for-profit institutions, uh, the, the private for-profit institutions. And this is a really interesting chart because it shows the distribution of undergraduate debt. And um, this is no debt all the way down to $40,000. And the, uh, the red is a public four-year, the blue is private four-year, and the green is for-profits. And you can see what's happened with the for-profit um, uh, colleges is if you're talking about a student loan debt problem, that's the problem. The, it, it was the, the for-profit institutions. Mm -hmm. And how many, uh, how, how do the for-profit institutions in number compare to the public institutions in the United States? Um, do you know yeah, that, you know that know figure? That? I don't know that figure. But it's, it's, these are, this is very much disproportionate to the sure. total enrollments. Sure, yes. yeah. President Jorgensen, well, tell me about uh, Columbia, or, Mobile Area, Area Community, Community College. College. Thank you. Yes, that's all right. Um, certainly, we too um, really take great concern and have great concern about student debt. But one of the things that community colleges across the nation do, is, as does MACC, we really maintain one of the lowest tuition rates across the board in higher education. So we know that students who are re really struggling financially, an option that they have is to attend a community college and get that first two years of higher education at the community college and then transfer to whatever four-year institution they would like to go to. And that reduces the total debt for those four years mm -hmm. of higher education. So community colleges, um, are, are very efficient, uh, very effective. We have a uh, small class size, uh, but our teachers um, are very um, good at what they do, and, and we try to make sure that students are getting everything they need, but at the same time, we keep the tuition very, very low. Uh, we have struggled as well in recent years as other public institutions have because our state support has shrunk as well, and so uh, it does leave uh, us in a situation where in order to pay the bills and operate, you do have to raise tuition because there's no other source of revenue to operate with when state and federal support drops. Mm -hmm. the community colleges, junior colleges, we used to call them, yes. have traditionally been kind of a springboard into four-year institutions, I think, for some people. 
Yes. Is that true for most of your students, or, or do it you have a... It really varies with uh, community colleges. Uh, many community colleges in the state are about 50-50, meaning that 50% of their students are interested in going on to a four-year institution, and the other 50% is interested in an associate degree that gets them right into the workforce. Mm -hmm. For example, um, nurses can become associate degree nurses with a two-year program uh, and go right into the workforce and many times start with $40,000 a year. So mm -hmm. for some people that is a great place to start and all they've invested is two years at a community college. So it's a very low investment, great return on that investment to go into the workforce. Uh, for MACC, Specifically, we have about 75 to 80 percent of our students who are interested in a four-year degree. Mm -hmm. And they come to us to get the first two years and get the general education courses and those kinds of things that they're going to need no matter where they go to college and get those out of the way and then transfer on to the four-year institution and begin to major in that specific area that they want to get their undergraduate degree in. Mm -hmm. for, for anybody who's not familiar with MACC, you have a, a campus in Columbia. Yes. You have uh, how many students? In Columbia, we have about 2,200 students. So it's a, yeah. 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 MACC is the second largest institution in Columbia. Yeah, yeah that's yes. <laughs> very interesting. Jim, I, uh, what has changed over this tough economy over the last four years for the university and for students uh, do you have uh, more students that you can attribute to this economy? Uh, and what's happening with graduate um, and job rates after graduation? It's a, it's a good question, Jim. We, um, we've seen, obviously, a, a pretty steady increase in enrollment at MU, um, growing both, well, growing primarily from our out-of-state students because the number of students graduating from high schools in the state of Missouri is on a decline. <coughs> And so almost 10 years ago, we drafted or created a strategy in our enrollment management group that's led by Dr. Ann Korshkin to go into communities out, outside of the state of Missouri to recruit students in to help us balance this en enrollment um, shift that we, we anticipated. Um, we didn't anticipate being as successful as we were mm -hmm. in bringing students to our campus. And that's been actually very, very important as our institution has been able to balance the loss of state support and replaced it with, with tuition um, revenue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in 1990, we were getting about 9000 a little more than $9,000 per student in state support. And this past year, we got a little under um, $4,500 in, in state support. And so we've had to increase tuition over time to make up that difference. Um, but at the same time, our out-of-state students who are paying a higher out-of-state tuition rate have been able to actually subsidize our, our in-state um, student tuitions. Will, the, will that growth uh, pay for itself um, forever? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, we've been able to, to expand our capacity to serve that increasing enrollment and um, just recently announced a $2.5 million um, investment in online um, e-learning initiative, which is going to be part of um, two efforts we're making. One is to expand our capacity to deliver instruction to our on-campus students, but also to expand accessibility um, for some of the students like Evelyn's RN students who want to advance professionally they can complete an RN to BSN degree with us online. Right. Or if they're um, a BSN student that lives in southwest Missouri or down in the boot hill, they can um, take an online master's degree with us and, and advance. So by expanding our online degree programs, we anticipate not only being able to, to expand our capacity for our on-campus enrollments, but also to continue to make higher education accessible by making it affordable. That RN nurse can stay in her job or his job in the local community in Northeast Missouri, yeah. but still take advantage of a, a bachelor's in nursing degree through the University of Missouri Columbia. That's pretty powerful. It's, mm -hmm. it's, we're, we're excited about it. Well, Terry, did, did Columbia College was out front on <coughs> online education. 
Uh, now I understand that you're trying to increase numbers on campus. Correct. Uh, what's, what's the dynamic there? Well, <clears throat> uh, we did get into online at a good time. Uh, in October of 2000, we had 180 students taking 10 classes. Um, this current session, we have 18,000 students taking about 800 classes. Wow. So we've done, that's, that's worked out for us. Mm -hmm. um, we all, but we have um, some, capac some unused capacity at the home campus. Uh, we also have uh, our, our building in terms of developing some, some academic programs. Uh, the, the sciences are gonna be even stronger. We've got the new building going up there that's gonna be a real centerpiece. Uh, for our campus, but we've gotten we've we've done some strategic um, program uh, identification. We've uh, last year uh, we just this fall we've launched four new academic programs. Uh, next fall we're going to launch at least five, and so um, we're trying to sort of add to our inventory mm -hmm. um, as well. Uh, and part of it's to in obviously to increase enrollments, but the other is just you know there's some there's some career fields out there where people don't have enough degree programs and we're, we're trying to identify those. If I could show one more chart because sure. this really s supports something that uh, both Jim and Evan were saying. This is uh, a chart about what's happened to, uh, this is uh, adjusting for inflation, what has happened to um, tuition in the last 30 years. And you can see it's a, uh, increased very steadily, uh, especially uh, the public four year, sure. uh, simply be to make up the gap that has formed because of the decreases in state funding. But it's interesting, and I'd, I'd be interested in what, what you all have to say about this, because a lot of this increase is, it's not like faculty are <clears throat> becoming bankers all of a sudden in terms of their, their incomes, or that um, co colleges all of a sudden have just become palaces and these lavish things. I think a lot of this has to do with unfunded mandates and how many administrators and staff we've had to add to deal with new programs that, would, that are, we're not necessarily choosing to implement. Mm -hmm. uh, the federal government and the state governments have, uh, have put a lot of requirements on colleges and universities that you have no option but to staff up for. Those things cost money. I think if you'd look at, uh, over at MU especially <coughs> at, the, uh, at the increase in your, in, in your employment, in, in the size of your employees, I would bet that the number of administrators and staff has increased three times as fast as the number of faculty. There, there's been a, a, a significant increase in compliance cost. Right. And one example that's affected, I suspect, both our, our institutions is with um, the new state authorizations in online distance education. Right. You know, um, as early as two Absolutely. years ago, um, we, we weren't required to have authorizations in the states outside of the state of Missouri to offer our degrees online to those students. And now we have three staff people that work on it almost full time. We have three. Um, and in addition to that, the fees associated with an accredited university right. having to, to, to have the permission of mm -hmm. the states that we're offering our degrees in. And, and some of the states, um, tens of thousands of dollars um, just in authorization fees or processing fees and 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 there are multiple examples across our campus in, in mm -hmm. our research environment and environmental health and safety um, and our higher education business has been affected by um, rising health care costs mm -hmm. the same way every industry right. has mm -hmm. been impacted and so they're pass it along and right. and and the cost of technologies yes. you know oh sure. my gosh and it's a big Big amount of that. And, and, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have a computer in every classroom. Sure. And now we have a computer and we have projectors. And our, our projector bulb replacement budget <laughs> is $60,000 a year now yeah, just to replace the bulbs yeah, and the projectors <laughs> in the computer projectors in our classroom. The technology costs are never ending, and we see that as well. And you certainly want to provide all of that for the students. They need it in order to graduate and be prepared for their next phase, whether that's going on to the universities and colleges or going into the workforce. So it really is very important to maintain high level technology, the software programs, the hardware, all of that changes very quickly and keeping up with that adds a great deal of cost. Mm -hmm. 
what, what is MACC doing in terms of online education? We have a, a large online enrollment. In fact, if we count that as a separate campus, as we sometimes do, that is our second largest campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's very big. And we continue to grow in that area. There continues to be interest from the students. They, um, they want that access to online courses. And we offer the full Associate of Arts degree uh, we are accredited by the Higher Learning Commission, as are these institutions, mm -hmm. and uh, received accreditation to offer the full Associate of Arts degree online. So a student can get the full AA degree uh, online if they choose to. Most students don't make that choice. Uh, they kind of mix and match and have some ground courses. We also offer hybrid courses where half of the course is online and the other half is on ground. And uh, some students prefer that, and then some students prefer to be face-to-face -face with that teacher mm -hmm, uh, right. in a very traditional way. But we make those options available, and it's, it's a, a very large, growing area. I think in, in our business, as well as yours, it's, it's about providing options. So right. they, however Absolutely. they want to get an education, however they want to read a newspaper, you have to present it to them. Yes. The, the challenge is making sure that we don't sacrifice or, or interfere with the student learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, all across higher education, the goal is providing access um, and, and using technology tools in the way that's appropriate while also maintaining the level of academic integrity Yes. Um, to make sure that, that that degree, whether it's on campus or online, is, is seen as a, um, a valid degree with the same level of rigor that you would have in a traditional face-to-face on-campus degree program. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious about, uh, you mentioned the cost um, spread in areas that you didn't have to deal with before. What does that mean for faculty? How, how have uh, faculty numbers increased as this enrollment increases? Well, we've, we've been able to increase enrollment and, and using the, the, the enrollment surge that's driving the tuition income. Our, our faculty, and, and that's one of the unique missions that MU has, is the, the, the research mission that we have and the graduate, the, the master's and the doctoral research right. programs, especially in those areas associated with um, um, science and technology, um, the biotechnology work that we do in, in the Bond Life Sciences Center. What we've seen those faculty are having to become more entrepreneurial and, and develop and, and seek out and be competitive in grants um, mm. so that they can, and some of our faculty are paying a portion or all of their salaries from the grants that they're receiving. And so we've We've tried to be as, as flexible um, and as entrepreneurial as possible in creating the revenue so that we can expand our faculty to achieve the mission that the state of Missouri has asked us to be responsible for, and that's research, teaching, outreach and extension, and economic development. Mm -hmm. Terry? Or, uh, I'm sorry. Were you... Either way. <laughs> yeah. uh, one of the things that, that we have done is relied a bit more on adjunct faculty yeah. members than we probably would like to do, but uh, they tend to be a bit more cost effective. And we are blessed in that we are in an environment where there are many doctoral students, postgraduate students at the university, there are retired professors and so forth who uh, like to teach and want to come and teach for us. So we do have high quality adjuncts, but um, if we had our druthers, we probably would hire more of them as full-time faculty members. Mm -hmm. And of course, that comes with all the benefits and all the things that we talked right. about that add to the cost right. of faculty members. I know Columbia College uses a mix of adjunct and, and professors too. Well, right? uh, nine out of 10 of our faculty, even more than that, would be part-time. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, Dr. Jorgensen and I share some adjuncts. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, which is very handy, and thank you. But, but <laughs> Uh, we have at any given time 800 uh, adjunct faculty uh, teaching all over the world. I mean, if you're going to teach online, you don't have to be you know, right. any place except ha have connectivity. Uh, we have currently 70 full-time uh, faculty. So, uh, but we've been like that for a long time. And 
one of the things, our, our great challenge is to kind of stay, uh, you know, one step ahead and, and stay nimble um, and, and, and be flexible simply because, you know, uh, the, the wolf is at the door in, in the sense that uh, people are preaching gloom and doom about higher education. I don't for a minute buy it because, you know, there's some, there's some smart people in sure. higher education one that, or two. that are going to figure this out and are figuring it out. But th there, there are some challenges. This for-profit for challenge is very real uh, mm -hmm. because what the federal government wants to do is throw out the baby with the bathwater right. and, uh, and put us all in the same, all, all of these sectors in the same general category and saying you guys are at fault for all the student debt and you guys are at fault for all the, the, uh, the low graduation rates. Well, wait a minute, let's take a look and let's take a closer look at this. But, but they do present a very, a very real challenge to us. And then there are all these brand new so-called revolutionary models about um, MOOCs, massive open online courses that Harvard and Princeton and Stanford are teaching literally tens of thousands of students all over the world. Uh, they're not making any money and they're not granting any credit for it, but they're still doing it. Uh, well, some, someday somebody's going to figure out how to make some money at that right. and mm -hmm. grant credit for that. Mm -hmm. And we've got to be prepared. Because, because because we'll get our lunches eaten if we're not, if we're not uh, reacting to it in a, in a, in a proper way. So I'm betting on really, Apple Corporation. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's really a time of great change in higher education. So and uh, each of you is uh, prepared for that change and looking down the road and and uh, and looking as, to thrive as best as you can predict the future. I think we're all trying to do that and do what we can. And one of the things about uh, the three of us here is. Uh, I've never, I've been in higher education a long time, and I mean, the, the cooperation Certainly. among sectors, among the, four, the, the two years, the four year uh, uh, privates and the, and the research institution is fabulous in this town. I mean, you know, we're working with each other all the time. We're all in the same business, and that is to educate students as well as we can. And if I can work with Dr. Jorgensen, you know, if I can work with Dr. Spain uh, to, to get that done, you know, give me a hard problem. So, I mean, this is, uh, it, it, this is a real great thing about education in Missouri. And, and we take great pride in being the institution that provides more transfer students to Columbia College and to MU than any other community college in the state. That's great. Even when you look at uh, St. Louis Community College with nearly 30,000 students. So we're, we're that's, that's, a, that. that's a pretty amazing testament to how you all do work together. That's great. Well, we're running out of time. Uh, strangely enough, right. you know, this goes by. I really appreciate you, you joining me tonight. Uh, Jim Spain, Terry Smith, and Evelyn Jorgensen. Uh, thank you for joining us. I hope you heard something that interested you. Maybe you learned something. Uh, on behalf of the Columbia and Boone County League of Women Voters, I'm Jim Robertson. Good night.